presenting today. Uh, he is doing a year-long pre-doctoral research fellowship at uh, the Department of Neurosurgery at University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, he's also the co-founder with myself of this group, Neurosurgery Education and Research Group. Uh, he's a medical student at Kansas City University College of Osteopathic Medicine, currently in between his third and fourth year. And he's also doing a Master's of Business Administration at Rockhurst University uh, Ellsberg School of Management. Um, so without further ado, I'll let them get on to the presentation. Awesome. Dr. DeGiorgio, did you want to quick say any, any words about uh, the introduction or anything else that you think would frame our conversation? No, I just want to say how impressed I am with this setup uh, and the work you guys have put into it. Uh, I think it's a really cool thing you guys are doing and um, pretty honored to be here uh, as, uh, as a guest. So thank you guys for inviting me. Yeah, we're, we're super pumped to have you, and uh, I'll, you're the expert here, so I'll try to be I'll try to be as brief as possible uh, in terms of, of my part in this. But uh, I'll share my screen, and, and we'll get right into it. So, um, so um, I'll uh, just give a quick um, uh, kind of blurb about what energy is all about. Um, so. Uh, Eddie is also doing a, a similar research fellowship at, at Duke University. Um, he's a student at Campbell. Uh, and through a mutual friend on Facebook, we got uh, paired together um, and now have struck up a, a great friendship and professional relationship and came up with the idea for this uh, research group um, that we have now brought in about 16 other folks on um, between KCU, Campbell, and uh, University of Colorado. And really the goal is to, um, you know, improve and 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 start earlier um, neurosurgery education and then develop professional and research, professional development and research skills. And so far it's been a great success. We're, I'm so encouraged by how fast this journal club got off the ground. Um, uh, so I wanna thank uh, Dr. Jeff Stottinger and Shelly Boyer for their, um, uh, them helping us get this, this started and uh, all the energy folks obviously for putting in the work and, and uh, working on research projects and, and trying to, um, you know, start earlier in their education. Most of them are MS ones and twos. Um, certainly, it's difficult to understand where to start if you're interested in, in neurosurgery. Um, so that's the goal. Um, and uh, if anyone out there uh, who's not a part of Energy thinks that there's something we could be doing or is passionate about uh, a, a particular idea, uh, don't don't hesitate to reach out to Eddie and I. Um, so we'll kind of get started. Um, I've already. Uh, said thanks to our, our sponsors, uh, certainly Dr. DiGiorgio for being here today, spending his precious time with us to, to frame the conversation um, from, from an expert's point of view. Um, I don't have any financial industry disclosures uh, to note. So um, today we're talking about the intersection between three big topics, which is uh, health economics, um, uh, the the clinical treat uh, the clinical practice of neurosurgery and then the peculiarities of acute spine trauma itself and um, each one of those topics deserves hours of education um, right people get degrees in each one of these things so uh, I'll try to talk about how they relate to each other in, in 10 to 15 minutes um, if at any time you have a question um, you can I, th I think during the presentation uh, I would request that you guys do it through the chat feature in Zoom. Um, Dr. DiGiorgio will also give his thoughts on this topic after, after my part, um, and then we'll have a, a quick discussion, um, uh, portion of the discussion that we can, uh, we can help to frame the conversation. So uh, just to give a brief overview, we kind of have a, a broad um, audience in terms of their expertise. So I'll give a, some quick thoughts on what acute spine trauma actually is and why we need to be talking about it. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, basically, it's injury penetrating or blunt to the uh, vertebral bodies and spinal cord and, and then it's associated structures, the vertebral discs, the joints, ligaments, um, anything that's associated with it. And uh, as you can expect, it's a pretty se severe injury in most cases um, with a lot of morbidity. Patients present with early mortality and are at risk of a lot of complications. Um, and so it's bad, but it's fairly rare. Um, uh, it accounts for about 3 to 23% of all uh, uh, trauma presentations to the ER in the United States and Canada. Um, global incidence is actually 700 per, uh, per million. And uh, the median age is, uh, the peak incidence is young adulthood. So um, it can be devastating for people at their peak, uh, their, uh, when they're at their peak work uh, capabilities. Um, but that age is increasing. Um, 
mostly due to uh, the increased incidence of falls, um, certainly fall from standing, downstairs, and uh, that's typically older patients, whereas motor vehicle accidents are, are decreasing. Um, this, is, this picture is just to give a frame uh, of reference for kind of what we're talking about. This is just a T2 sagittal image of the cervical spine. Um, you can see the, the vertebral bodies, the discs, the spinal cord, um, and the, uh, uh, the CSF and spinous processes. So just kind of keep this picture in mind as, as we move forward. Um, Something that to also keep in mind is that we think of the spine as a homogeneous structure, right? We, you know, it's the spine, right? It's all one thing. Um, but each part of the spine has its own personality uh, in terms of um, the, the physiology of what it's innervating, um, uh, as well as the adjacent structures, whether visceral or neurovascular. And so um, that will uh, inform the nuance that is related to the, the care of particular patients um, uh, in terms of acute spine trauma. Uh, so what is the treatment? So we're going to kind of, we're not going to talk about the medical and the emergent treatment in the field. Um, we're going to assume that the patient has been stabilized in the field, their airway has been managed, um, they're, they're stabilized with the sea collar, or uh, uh, they're on a backboard or, or something like that, and now they're in the ER, and uh, they've had a thorough um, initial workup, uh, a neurological examination, and uh, hopefully some imaging ordered, usually plain film radiographs. Um, or CT, which is the gold standard if a fracture is suspected. And uh, neurosurgery is then consulted, and um, we, we think about what uh, we need to do next. And um, there's some debate about when to do things, what to do, um, and, and, and how to do them. So um, typically, um, if the spinal cord is at risk, you're gonna address that immediately, as immediate as possible, whether it's edema that's compressing the spinal cord or a fracture, an unstable fracture where a fragment is, is potentially gonna injure the spinal cord. And so we're gonna fix that with hardware or decompress it via laminectomy or discectomy if the disc is involved um, so that we can achieve a, 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 an optimal clinical outcome, which is, you know, in broad strokes purposes is, is mortality and morbidity. Um, so, that's kind of just the, the general idea of what, the, what our treatment goal is. And, and each patient will obviously be individualized. Um, so when a patient comes in, you know, we think about these things in, in, in kind of three buckets. And there are different validated scales that we use in a clinical sense to um, inform our clinical decision making, as well as the more, uh, think about the morphology of a fracture or, or the injury to its adjacent structures. So, um, you know, T-Lex, AOSpine, Asia scales, there's one for odontoid fractures. Um, and we think about, we correlate the, the imaging to the patient's neurological exam. So, um, you know, from a clinical standpoint, that's what we're using to, to hopefully achieve the best clinical outcome that we can. So, but what we're talking about today is, you know, how that relates to um, the economic burden of acute spine trauma. Um, direct medical costs is significant. And so that's just the A to B transaction of a particular service for a, for a, an issue, and so that can be anywhere from five hundred thousand up to two million dollars over a patient's lifetime, and, and total healthcare costs can be up to three million dollars um, for a patient that uh, suffers an AST at the age of twenty five, and that doesn't even take into account, like I said earlier, the the peak incidence is of a fairly young person, right, and that's at their optimal work age, and so labor costs, um, the the cost of lost labor is something that uh, potentially is not always uh, added into these calculations and is also something to th keep in mind. So thinking about that, it's a significant economic burden, it's a significant clinical burden. How do we relate those things in a cost uh, restrained environment that is unfortunately the case in, in most of our health systems, um, whether it's public or private, uh, privately insured. So to give some definitions for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with the economic lingo, um, they'll often see in, in cost effectiveness discussions this thing called qualities, which is just quality adjusted life years. Um, it's a scale of zero to one, and it's a function of at a certain quality of life, what is the health gain for a particular intervention or service or, or policy? And um, it's uh, at one, it's perfect bill of health, one year of perfect, perfectly uh, uh, prescribed health, and zero is, is dead, right? And so on that scale, we, we think about what the um, the benefit is for a particular intervention. And then we use that as a fun as a re ratio of resource consumption for cost effectiveness. And, and cost effectiveness and utility are 
basically the same thing. Um, you, sometimes they're, they're differentiated. Um, comparison analysis is pretty straightforward. We're just looking at the, the, the consumption of resources and benefits of the, the service between two different things. And then uh, the willingness to pay threshold you'll often see is, uh, is a function of what the payer is going to bring to the table. So maybe they are only willing to pay $50,000 for a service and at, at, at that willingness to pay, it's cost effective. But if you're only willing to pay 25,000, maybe it's not cost effective. So there's so many things we can keep, we, can, we could talk about today. Um, uh, and uh, frankly, I was struggling a little bit with how uh, much there was to talk about. Um, but I, I think it's a great conversation because it'll inform um, what, you know, kind of our clinical practice as well as um, more high level minded things that we need to think about from an administrative standpoint. Um, so the journal article today, if you got a chance to read it, um, it's a scoping review on health economics and neurosurgery for acute spine trauma. Um, it was uh, written by Brian Chan of the Toronto Re Rehabilitation Institute, um, as well as several authors from the University of Toronto. And it was published in the journal of neurosurgery in May of 18. Um, it's a systematic review with scoping synthesis. Basically, this, they just did a, a systematic review of a particular uh, topic and then uh, did that to answer a particular question, um, which is what the scoping synthesis part is. Um, they, uh, they ultimately uh, found 11 articles that fit their eligibility criteria um, based on keywords and, and uh, uh, different costing models. Um, so if you're not familiar with the PRISMA diagram, this is kind of how systematic analysis is conducted. Um, you'll do a keyword search and then uh, find a bunch of articles and then you'll uh, designate uh, typically two reviewers to uh, uh, skim that down to um, the, the handful of articles that you want to include in your analysis. And one thing to keep in mind with this article is they, they only employed one dedicated reviewer and that was something that I was, that was um, uh, something suboptimal, but they, they actually note that in the, the discussion as something that they, they wish they had done, which is add a second reviewer, but they do note that it didn't uh, probably affect their, their uh, uh, methods too much. <clears throat> so they break it down kind of by spinal level as well as costing model. <coughs> and um, they, these are the 11 articles broken down by both of these two subgroups and um, they come up with this. So <clears throat> these are 11 articles on the left side. And then you've got the different costing model and the patient type uh, uh, right here, and then um, and how those two relate to each other. Most of them are uh, either cervical or thoracolumbar. Um, you might have you got the one type two odontoid fracture right here, uh, paper, and then looking at the intervention in the comparator. Um, and so that's what we're going to be uh, talking about today. Um, because this is a systematic review, um, I'm going to be highlighting three articles in, in a in a particular finding out of each one instead of looking at all of them because each one could um, deserve its own journal club uh, article discussion. So the first one is uh, the Furlong 2016 paper looked at um, the cost effectiveness of early versus late uh, surgical decompression of uh, uh, cervical uh, spinal cord injury, um, which is something that's very clinically relevant um, in terms of clinical outcomes. The the literature is a little uh, gray on the best time to address certain patients. And that's what a lot of those um, uh, validated scales I was talking about earlier are trying to answer. Um, and Dr. DiGiorgio might have um, some thoughts on that uh, later. But um, so that, that's what we're looking at and, and seeing if there's a health economic component. Um, in terms of incomplete versus complete spinal cord injury, um, they found that early decompression was more cost effective than uh, uh, a late or delayed decompression, you know, after 24 hours um, and, and willing, for all willingness to, uh, to pay thresholds. Um, now, you know, that's, that's, you have to think about that in the context of, of what the actual clinical outcome is. Um, you know, this utility difference is looking at quality adjusted of life years. Um, so clinical outcomes aren't necessarily, uh, might not be that different, but the cost effectiveness of it is. Um, so that that's something that to to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, this is just, again just saying basically just saying that, and that might be seen a lot like five fifty eight million dollars for quality adjusted life year, but that's for a full quality adjusted life year. Not many of these patients are gaining a full year of uh, a benefit from a particular intervention, right? Um, 
and so that that was their conclusion. Um, and, and certainly at uh, a willingness to pay threshold of fifty thousand dollars, they found that there's a cost-effective uh, model that you can use uh, implement in your surgical centers um, by doing uh, early decompression at under 24 hours versus late. Um, so the second paper that we looked at is the, the Lee 2017 paper. Um, it's in the thoracolumbar spine um, for burst fractures, so T11 to L2, um, and uh, whether or not removal of the pedicle screw for fixation purposes is cost-effective. Um, you know, mo uh, from my research, you know, the removal of the pedicle screw is typically done if uh, if it's bothering the patient, if there's discomfort. Um, but there, there is, a, and if you're not familiar with pedicle screw, this is kind of what you're looking at. So um, it's going to fix the the uh, vertebral body um, that has been fractured. Um, and so some surgeons would remove that depending on the clinical uh, presentation of the patient. Um, but they can be left in. And so they were looking at the, the economic uh, standpoint of whether or not leaving those in versus taking them out was cost effective. So um, as you would imagine, an extra surgery is going to cost more, but they found that a quality just a life year gain um, for both uh, up to two years after the initial injury um, for both uh, surgeries, whether or not it's a one year or two years. Um, and so they concluded that removing the pedicle screw is actually more cost effective than leaving it in. And I'm very interested to hear what Dr. DeGiorgio has to say about that later. Um, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting finding. Um, and, you know, whether or not that's related to only clinical presentation or uh, for all patients, whether or not they're uh, presenting with discomfort is something that, that is an interesting finding, uh, certainly. All right, so this last paper is a uh, the Ninjala uh, 2015 paper. It used the national inpatient sample to assess whether or not there's a difference in cost effectiveness for weekday and weekend admissions for patients that underwent cervical spine fusion. Um, the main reason I wanted to talk about this is it's interesting. They, they, find, they find that, um, you know, there's a higher cost for weekend admissions um, basically across the board compared to weekday. Um, which could be a number of things, whether or not there's different staff in the hospital, um, the ability to uh, engage in early decompression um, might be constrained, um, or, or early surgery, I mean. Um, but they, they, the paper itself actually had a, a, a small flaw in the terms uh, of the, the patients that they were looking at themselves. The groups uh, had a significant difference in the demographics and comorbidities. So uh, that could be influencing the results and something that um, everyone should keep in mind when they're looking at uh, these kind of papers. So, um, like I said, I only picked out three of the articles. So, um, <clears throat> there, are, there are a bunch more conclusions. I mean, there were 11 articles that the paper uh, notes on. Um, and so, basically, uh, surgery for younger patients uh, in the cervical and thoracolumbar spine uh, at, at an earlier Earlier is better from a cost effectiveness standpoint, um, and, and that is for uh, uh, spinal cord injuries as well as uh, fractures. Um, and then they also do talk about fall prevention, which is something that you would think is, is probably a reasonable thing to do that would be cost effective. And there's a number of studies out there that have shown that fall prevention and other uh, preventive strategies uh, for acute spine trauma in particular um, would be cost saving as well as cost effective. So basically, if, if acute spine trauma, it, gross incidence is increasing and the median age is increasing for, uh, the, for AST patients, um, we, we think about this in two kind of frames of reference, right, which is the clinical standpoint, achieving the best possible clinical outcome for our individual patient, um, as well as looking at it more, uh, maybe 30,000 foot view, um, you know, from a hospital administration standpoint and saying, how can we... Um, improve the cost effectiveness of our acute spine trauma care. And those two things oftentimes line up and sometimes those two things butt heads. And, and traditionally the clinical care of the patient is gonna trump whatever the cost effectiveness um, outcome that we're looking at, right? Um, as it should. And so um, that, that's something to keep in mind, you know, um, basically, you know, if, if there are ways that we can um, manage our ER uh, and, and put in uh, workflow uh, incentives to uh, engage in earlier decompression or um, uh, evaluating our uh, data on our within our institution in terms of different imaging protocols 
uh, and surgical uh, instrumentation uh, protocols that we use, those things can certainly uh, affect the um, the cost effectiveness uh, of our care. Um, but ultimately, it is about the patient, right? So. Um, the, the, the paper itself does have some limitations. I talked about that it only had one dedicated literature review uh, reviewer. Um, each study, it's uh, paper within the study is, has some limited generalizability, obviously, um, based on the patient demographic. Um, gray literature, I won't get too much into that, but basically that's just literature published in the, um, uh, like the indus industrial world or the, the government uh, sector. Um, and then, you know, healthcare access and coverage is such a huge thing. And, you know, each paper, I didn't get into this too much, but each paper talks about whether or not it's from the point of view of a public or private insurer. And that certainly has a, a, a part to play. And I mean, actually defining what the cost of something is itself is so difficult. And so that's why uh, this is a very complicated um, endeavor to figure out the health economic implications of really any service, but certainly something as complex and severe as acute spine trauma. All the papers are in high income countries, so you can't make conclusions about low income uh, environments. Um, and then no health administrators themselves were consulted. So this is the key takeaway, right? So um, I'm just gonna read this because it's something that I think I hope everyone pulls away from this conversations um, that from a neurosurgical practice as well as an administrative practice, um, if we thoroughly uh, implement preventive strategies such as fall prevention in combination with workflows and encourage early surgical management of acute traumatic spinal cord injury or spine fracture, pedicle screw removal, removal up to two years after injury, surgery for type two odontoid fractures in, in uh, younger patients as opposed to older patients, and comprehensive conservative therapies could significantly impact the economic burden of acute spine trauma on the healthcare system. So uh, hopefully that, that will give you guys um, uh, something to work with moving forward. If, if this is a research interest of yours or uh, economic interest of yours or a, a clinical interest of yours. Um, but despite that, you know, like I said earlier, each individual patient should be treated with their unique needs and concerns in mind. So um, the clinical outcome, certainly from a neurosurgical practice, which is most of us here, is, is the most important thing to keep in, keep in mind. So here's our references. And uh, thank you so much for listening to me uh, talk. I'm, I'm interested to hear what Dr. DiGiorgio uh, has to say about all this. Yeah, uh, good job. <clears throat> that, that was uh, not an easy paper to go over because there's a lot to digest there. Uh, a few quick comments. Uh, I love the weekend paper that NIS. Yeah. You can't really choose when the spinal cord traumas come into the hospital. Uh, so I think right. it, that one just argues to, um, you know, make sure you're fully really staffed on the weekends. Uh, you know, if the administrator is right. trying to come back, the people covering weekends, uh, it's a good counter argument to that. And then uh, the pedicle screw uh, removal paper. Um, <clears throat> so that, you know, we will sometimes do percutaneous pedicle screws for burst fractures. Um, and you know, the, the goal is to provide internal stabilization, not necessarily to provide arthrodesis or bony fusion across different joints. Um, and then once the stabilization is complete, usually six months, you have the option of taking those screws out. And <clears throat> I'll usually leave it up to the patients. Um, and you know, about half of them will say, I want the screws out, they're bothering me, and half will just want them left in. So it usually comes down to the patient preference. But uh, that's a good paper because some people would argue against taking them out, uh, saying it's not worth the extra surgery from a cost uh, standpoint. Um, so that's a good paper to show that why why that makes sense. But uh, let right. me let me sh share my screen here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So is it typically it's just the fact that the patient is feeling discomfort that the pedicle screws are removed at six months? Yeah. Is so that they what you're saying. Serve they serve no further purpose um, if you're not getting right. bony arthrodesis across the joint once the fracture has healed. Um, so it's, uh, you know, that you can go ahead and take them out um, just because all they're going to do is kind of loosen. They'll sort of hollow out the pedicle a little bit um, because there is micro motion across the joint if you've not achieved uh, bony fusion. Right. Um, if bony arthrodesis across the joint is your goal, like for degenerative spine disease, um, then you don't want to take those screws out because uh, the, the bone is actually going to fuse across the joint. So, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Is there a risk of, uh, like, um, the screw breaking or is there yeah, a, any, Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and usually it's not the breaking of the screw that causes a problem. It is the, um, the fact that you haven't achieved an arthrodesis. So if you are, you know, fusing someone okay. for, uh, instability, or for axial back pain, secondary to degenerative disease, 
um, and that screw breaks and they still have motion, that's usually going to be non-physiologic motion, which will be painful. Um, and so right. it's not a broken screw that's the problem. It's the fact that they have non-physiologic motion that you need to then stabilize. Because they didn't fuse <clears throat> over time. Uh, first, we have Dr. Anthony DiGiorgio here today. Uh, he's an assistant professor of neurosurgery at the University of California in San Francisco. Uh, he specializes in the treatment of traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. Um, he did his training uh, medical school at Tour University College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he did his residency training as well as a master's in health administration at uh, LSU. Uh, once completing that, he did a fellowship in neurotrauma and neuro, neurocritical care and minimally invasive and complex spine research at UCSF, where he's currently at now. Um, so we're glad to have Dr. DeGiorgi on today. And, um, you know, please take advantage of this opportunity to uh, network and be able to ask questions and discuss. Um, I'm sure that he has a wealth of information that can help us all. Um, additionally, we'll have Mike Quartz. Um, uh, so again, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk about a little bit of this. So. Uh, of course, I have no financial disclosures. I wish I did. I wish someone would pay me to have opinions, but I don't. Um, <clears throat> so just outline what I'm going to talk about, and please uh, stop me if we go long. I want to leave a little time if you guys have any questions. Uh, but let's discuss this paper. Um, I have a few tips for research for med students and early residents um, that I've kind of gleaned over my uh, circuitous path to uh, being assistant professor at UCSF. And I'm just going to give a little brief outline, and hopefully you guys can get some uh, some tips and some insights on you know how this guy went from uh, DO school to, to being assistant professor at UCSF, um, which I still kind of uh, am in disbelief a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> so here's our paper. Um, it's a lot to digest. Michael, I think you did a great job um, summarizing it because uh, there's a whole lot in here. Um, some basics about it. So the review article is uh, it's a very difficult article to write. A lot of, uh, <clears throat> along with case reports, probably the, the thing that med students will come up to me asking, you know, hey, Dr. George, do you have any need for assistance on case reports or review articles? Um, and, and that's tough because, you know, if review articles would ease, were easy, everyone would do them. Um, and that's all we would have, right? Because you don't actually need to do any primary research. You don't need any data in order to put one of these articles, articles together. Um, so in order to do a good review, review article, it's actually even more work than, um, than just any primary research. And uh, uh, Dr. Chan, who put together this article, is a, a fantastic leader in the field. Um, and this is an example of a really good review article. So um, th they are absolutely not easy things to do, but uh, they're excellent resources when you, have, uh, when you find a good one like this one because it leads you down that rabbit hole of all these other studies that you can then look at. <clears throat> so that, that's why I wanted to highlight this one because it is such a good review article and, and it does allow you to, uh, to get a good list of references that you can, you can pull out and start, <clears throat> excuse me, start looking at. Um, and you, know, you, you start getting one reference and you pull that up on PubMed and you know, PubMed list five more references related to it. You read those and you know, the, like I said, you're, you end up going down the rabbit hole. And next thing you know, you're, you know a whole lot about the topic. So, um, let's, uh, let's take a look at one of the articles that I think highlights this, um, this subject of spinal cord injury and spine trauma and just the, the ethics and feasibility of research behind uh, spinal cord injury and spine trauma and why it's so hard. Uh, so <clears throat> I picked the Furlan um, paper about uh, early versus late decompression as you did, uh, Michael, to highlight this one. So uh, Furlan and Phalanx are out of Toronto. Um, and, and Michael Failings is a spinal cord injury expert up there, and he put together this trial, the Astasis trial, where it's basically just looking at early versus late decompression and surgery on spinal cord injury patients. So there, uh, the paper that we highlighted that was in this review uh, is a cost effectiveness analysis from that trial. So it actually comes from their overall trial. So this is the paper uh, uh, published by Michael Failings that it gives the overall results of that trial. Uh, and then the paper that was included in this review was just their cost analysis of that trial. So, you know, so of course, you put together a big trial like this, you're going to get a bunch of papers out of it. So um, in order to evaluate the cost effectiveness, we need to evaluate the science <clears throat> behind their research. Um, so they basically said, uh, based on this trial, that operating on people within 24 hours after spinal cord injury has slightly better outcomes. Um, <clears throat> we also looked at that here at UCSF. 
Um, and we actually categorize it into ultra early, which is less than 12 hours, whereas their early cutoff was 24 hours. And we showed that within 12 hours, it has even greater benefit than within 24 hours. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Arabi at uh, Mass, or excuse me, uh, Maryland Shock Trauma looked at it and said, hey, no, uh, within 12 hours doesn't matter. The thing that does matter is uh, the amount of medullary uh, signal in the spinal cord after the trauma. So they used a different surrogate uh, to show prediction of, of when to operate on people and, and showed that within 12 hours didn't, didn't work. So you have three studies that show sort of differing results. Um, you know, the review article did not include these three studies because it was, again, an economics base. But if you're going to look at the economics, you really have to look at, at the science behind it. So why are these results so disparate? <clears throat> well, in, a lot, in evaluating literature, you guys all know that randomized control trial is your gold standard, right? So in order to get level one evidence for any treatment, you need a randomized control trial. Um, barring that, your other options are cohort studies, either looking forward, enrolling people at the time of their injury and doing a prospective cohort study, or looking back and basically doing a chart review in a retrospective cohort study. <clears throat> and then you can use things like propensity matching and case control in order to separate your cohorts into different groups in order to get, uh, to get comparisons. So, you know, if you were trying to do a randomized controlled trial in spine trauma and the timing behind uh, operative intervention in spine trauma, your surgery, your experimental setup would essentially look like this. Someone would come in with spinal cord injury. They would either be included in your uh, trial or excluded based on your uh, relatively narrow inclusion and exclusion criteria. And you'll notice most randomized control trials do have very narrow inclusion and exclusion criteria because they want to make sure that they get uh, legitimate results. And then that patient would be randomized into early or late surgery. And then you would record your outcome of, that you wanted, you know, whether it was the motor score, the quality of life, the cost, et cetera. Um, this is hard to do, right? Because if you come into uh, San Francisco General Hospital and we're on call, um, we treat all our spinal cord injuries within eight hours because we have this paper that I showed you that shows that patients operate on within 12 hours do substantially better. So it would be unethical for us to randomize you and not operate on you within eight hours, right? <clears throat> and I think most surgeons would probably believe that. So, you know, this is not possible because we can't ethically put anyone in a randomization because uh, we lack what is called equipose between early and late surgery. So it's difficult to evaluate this. So how these studies were done, and even, you know, the, failing, the original failings trial, the stasis trial was done this way. It was a prospective cohort study where the person shows up with a spinal cord injury. Uh, <clears throat> they're enrolled in this trial, which is really just a database, uh, and they're treated per the local standard of care as the surgeon and, and uh, treating teams see fit. And then the outcomes were recorded. Everything was recorded about their stay. And then you look back at those things and you separate them into groups based on when they're operated on or whatever comparison you want to make between the groups. And then <clears throat> in order to match those two groups, because they're not randomized, there will be differences between the two groups. In order to match them, you have to do some statistical analysis, whether that's multivariate regression propensity matching or some more advanced machine learning techniques, you still have to do a lot of statistical hand waving in order to get yourself to even matched groups as if they were randomized when they clearly weren't. Um, now I mentioned that there's no level one evidence for anything we do in spine surgery. And I, I'm sure some of you have heard people kind of jokingly tongue in cheek say, well, there's no level one evidence for parachutes, right? Uh, so if you jump out of a plane, no one's ever done a randomized controlled trial to put a parachute on you or not. Uh, so this British Medical Journal did this kind of tongue-in-cheek article uh, where they did try a randomized controlled trial for parachutes. And uh, if you look at the results, um, <clears throat> they show that parachute use did not significantly reduce death or major injury when jumping out of an airplane. But they found since the participants in the study, the only way they could ethically do this was to allow the participants to enroll or not enroll. And they found that, of course, the participants that enrolled jumped from an average of 0.6 meters were the ones that didn't enroll in the study and did their normal parachute jumped at an average of 9,000 meters and lower velocity. <clears throat> so basically, hey, this is a great randomized controlled trial, but when you read the fine text, it shows that people didn't really uh, enroll in the trial as they would not be expected to if they're actually gonna jump out of an airplane. But you could say, based on level one evidence, parachutes do not help uh, when jumping out of an airplane. But I think that this still kind of shows you that sometimes level one evidence is simply not going to happen. And the best we can do is these kind of uh, cohort, prospective and retrospective cohort studies. So back to spinal cord injury. Um, parachute principle, I think, applies here. If you come in again into our hospital, we're going to be operating on you within eight hours. 
because we think it's unethical, just like if we were to push you out of an airplane without a parachute or with a randomized parachute. <clears throat> um, and that's why a lot of this literature in spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, a lot of surgical literature is based on cohort studies. So you have to look at why were these patients operated on early versus late, right? They're not truly randomized into these two groups. The early surgeries most likely were healthier, had fewer uh, concomitant injuries. Uh, if someone comes in with an open abdomen and a spinal cord injury, we're not going to operate on them within 12 hours because the general surgeons are going to take them and repair their much more pressing surgical issues. So you have to look at, at why these groups were, just, were divvied up into early versus late. And you can do all the statistical analysis you want on them, uh, but you're never going to truly get those two groups randomized. Uh, so you know, there's, because there's all these other factors, you can make an argument. You can certainly say, in our experience, early surgery is better than late surgery, but you'll never have level one evidence to back that up. Um, <clears throat> so moving on from that, looking at the economics behind this, uh, the reason I'm very interested in healthcare economics and policy is because, as you guys will find out when you start practicing, that everything in your life, everything that you do is going to be dominated by economics and policy. It's usually administrators making policy decisions based on their understanding of the healthcare economics. And in order to you to have your patient's best interest at heart, you have to, I think, understand those. And I found that the more that I understand the economics, the administration, the policy decisions behind these, I was able to help my patients out a bit better. Uh, and that's why I ended up getting that master's in healthcare administration. Um, <clears throat> so again, I looked at the other Furlan article for this one, uh, the elderly uh, with traumatic spinal cord injury. Uh, again, this is out of Furlan and Failings from Toronto. Uh, this is out of that, stain, that same study. Uh, and uh, Michael, you did a great job discussing qualities. Um, it's a cost utility analysis on this paper. Uh, and they basically just found that elderly patients are more expensive to care for after spinal cord injury than younger patients, which sort of makes sense, right? And you, you figure an elderly patient's gonna have a longer length of stay, uh, a higher chance of having complications, um, probably need more extensive rehab than a younger patient. <clears throat> um, but they didn't compare that to non-operative treatment, right? So. You know, th this is why I get worried when these articles get published. I think this is a great article and I would never discourage it getting published, but I would hate for, you know, someone that makes policy decisions to look at this and say, whoa, elderly patients are much more expensive. Uh, maybe we shouldn't offer them surgery, but we don't know what it costs them to not offer them surgery. And that, that's really the branch point in your decision making as a clinician is whether or not to offer them surgery, uh, not whether or not to make them younger. So, you know, because we're, we have to make these decisions, it's, you know, we don't want to have to push back against administration with no data and say, why are you operating on this 85 year old? Well, it's just because nobody's looked at non-operative treatment. Um, <clears throat> and again, there's other literature out there. And when you start going down the rabbit hole, you may find this article, which is again published by our group at San Francisco. Um, and then on the left, I took the table out of the uh, Furlan and Failings paper uh, with their inju injury characteristics. And on the right, is the one out of this paper from uh, Daryl Lau. And if you notice the length of stay in the Furlan paper versus the length of stay in our paper, uh, <clears throat> their uh, elderly individuals stay almost 60 days on average in the hospital, in the acute care hospital. Whereas in our paper, uh, the elderly patients stay on average 21 days. So less than half as long. And you can see that there's a little bit of uh, difficulty in making a cost analysis uh, when your length of stay differ that much. And if anyone can think about it, uh, this, the Furlan Failings paper was out of Canada, and we're not going to get political, but there are some substantial differences in the way uh, healthcare is funded in Canada and the United States, uh, and that may account for some of these differences. So, this again, the Furlan paper is a great paper, but the generalizability um, and being able to say that elderly patients may not be worthwhile on a quality basis to operate on, that is a little bit of a stretch. So um, it's important to see these papers, it's important to understand them, it's important to know the other literature that's out there, um, because heaven forbid, like I said, some administrator tries to stop you from operating on an 85 year old with a spinal cord injury, uh, you need to be able to back up your decisions. So in healthcare economics research, you'll find that there are assumptions and biases abound. Um, like I said, that furlong failings paper makes a lot of assumptions about the treatment of spinal cord injury patients, whether or not it's generalizable to say that your elderly patients are going to stay nearly 60 days in the hospital. Um, and people will absolutely have biases. 
And <clears throat> occasionally that will lead to policy decisions that are not often scrutinized. We scrutinize drugs uh, and treatments ad nauseum, but a lot of times we don't scrutinize the policy decisions and they can have as far reaching of consequences uh, as you know, giving the wrong medication. So uh, you know, if you go into the policy literature, uh, this is a paper that, that I published with Praveen uh, where we looked at the overlapping surgery policy at our hospital and found that you know, once the hospital let us do overlapping surgery, patients actually stayed in the hospital for a shorter amount of time uh, and had fewer complications because we could operate on them sooner when they came in through the ER with some traumas. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very famous paper that looked at the CMS uh, hospital readmission reduction program and found that by CMS in disincentivizing readmitting patients with heart failure, uh, it actually increased the mortality, decreased the readmission, so it had the desired approach, but actually uh, caused some patients to have uh, worsening mortality. And then this is another famous paper that looked at uh, when CMS started uh, incentivizing patient satisfaction scores, and you actually get reimbursed based on your patient satisfaction scores. Uh, patient satisfaction goes up, but the patients with the highest satisfaction actually also have increased mortality. Uh, so <clears throat> that's why it's important for me, that's why I started learning this literature and think that it's important to know uh, the literature behind policy and economics because it will drive a whole lot of your life uh, as a doctor and um, knowing this literature I think is important. <clears throat> so if I were to give some tips, uh, for med students and junior residents on research, uh, read everything you can. These, these review articles are great because like I said, you can go down that rabbit hole um, and really end up reading a whole lot of articles and primary research on your topic of choice. Um, but it's important to know your journals and your impact factors. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, all journals are not created equal and an article published in one journal versus another journal uh, certainly should have different um, standing in your mind as you read it. Uh, and then Google is just as good of a resource as PubMed. Uh, Google Scholar is actually very good. And their search algorithm, I find, is a little bit better than PubMed. PubMed is great uh, because it shows you, you know, articles like this article and articles that that article has been cited in. Um, so again, if you're trying to go down that rabbit hole learning about things, uh, both Google and PubMed are great. Uh, if you're interested in healthcare economics research, uh, this is an NIH uh, health economics self-study course. Um, so you can go here and they, they have, you can see the little modules. Um, they'll show you how to write these sorts of papers, uh, these sorts of review papers. Uh, so you can go ahead and screenshot this, or if you email me afterwards, I can give you this, this link. Uh, but this is a pretty cool little, little module and they got little quizzes you can take. Um, <clears throat> if you're ever looking for inspiration on a topic, Google the neuro neurosurgical focus call for papers. Um, every month, neurosurgical focus from the JNS will have a call for a different uh, theme uh, for that month and they will take papers based on that theme. Uh, so if you're ever looking you know, to see for inspiration and you want you know, one of these things that pops up on this call for papers really interests you, uh, it's a good idea to start looking, for, looking around, doing a deep dive in the literature and maybe seeing if you can come up with a project. Um, this is, I didn't find out about this until I think my fourth year of residency. Um, and all of a sudden, I think most of my publications from there on out have been in neurosurgical focus because uh, it's a really good resource. So the Chan paper was a neurosurgical focus yeah. paper, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was, uh, and I, I think uh, that issue was uh, the healthcare economics issue. Yeah, was the Chan paper. So yeah, it, it's, it's a great, great resource. resource. And then I, I love reading the the issues too because the ones that really interest me uh, have some great articles. You know, I'm I'm not as interested personally in gene and viral therapy for glioblastoma, but I mean, this is going to be a fantastic issue for anyone that is. Mm -hmm. And then if, if you're going to do research, you should really know your basic statistics. You should be able to run a t-test, a chi-squared, and then a basic multivariate regression. Um, if you don't know how to do this, and don't worry about it, I did not, again, until about my fourth or fifth year of residency. Um, there are a bunch of YouTube videos online and a bunch of online courses you can do for free uh, that will help you learn to do these things. And that's what I ended up doing uh, during my fourth and fifth year when I was with uh, Dr. Muminetti. Um, and then if, you, if you're going to run stats, you know, these are some good uh, resources. You can get SPSS. This is a program I use. Uh, it's normally like $2,000 from IBM. But if you go to studentdiscounts.com and you have a .edu uh, email address, you can get it for, I think, like 60 bucks. Uh, R is free, but you, you need to know how to program to do R. I, it's way over my head. I can't figure it out. Uh, and a lot of UCSF residents, I know, use Stata, uh, so if you're interested in that one. But they're just different programs that you can, you can do your basic statistics, because that's going to be 
Um, you know, if you're working with anyone on research, you're going to want to at least run these basic stats. Anything more advanced than that, you're going to want to get a true statistician involved. Um, but, you know, for your basic bread and butter papers, uh, these should be enough. Uh, and those case reports and review articles, I know you guys know this movie, if you build it, they will come. Uh, don't go hunting those down, they will come to you. Uh, you know, if you're on a rotation and attending is gonna come up to you and be like, hey, this was a great case, let's write it up. That's how you're gonna get those case reviews, reports and review articles. And again, the review articles are the toughest articles in literature to write because they have to be so good um, and they really should be done by the experts in the field. Um, <clears throat> so does anyone have any questions so far? I was gonna, uh, like I said, give a little, little few tips on how I got into neurosurgery and how I got to UCSF. Um, if you guys are interested, looks like we've got about 10 more minutes. Sound good? You, yeah, you can take as much time as you want, really. People can trickle out if they need to. Sure. So um, I, I took a very circuitous route to get here. Um, took me three years to even get into med school. Uh, in, the, in the interim, I did interoperative neuromonitoring. Uh, and at one, you know, when I got into Toro, California, it was the last interview I'd ever done. It, I got on the wait list. I was ready to give up on even going to med school. Um, but then I got to Toro and somehow ended up matching uh, into neurosurgery. So, you know, I know it's hard for DOs to to match into neurosurgery, especially now that the matches are combined. Um, <clears throat> so the way I w went through it is there was no VSAS uh, for DO students when I went through. Uh, so I just emailed, I cold emailed every program I could. Um, and I got four away rotations that way. And the last away rotation I did was at LSU. The first away rotations, I'm not going to, Mention where they were, but they're a little discouraging. I didn't like uh, I didn't like some of the programs. I figured I didn't like neurosurgery at that point. I was ready again to give up uh, and try a different career path. Um, and then I, and then I found LSU, and I loved it there. Uh, it was a great program. Uh, the faculty were fantastic. Uh, it was they were very hardworking as any neurosurgery program was. But um, what I really found there was uh, a family, um, and that that's what your your rotation should be. Uh, you know, when finding these places, you really want to find a place where you match. It's called a match for a reason. Um, and, you know, this was, I got married my seventh year of residency, and this is pictured from the wedding where, you know, all my old chiefs came back and a lot of the faculty were there and my co-residents. So, you know, at LSU, I really felt like I fit in. I felt like a match there. Um, and I got lucky that you know, all the hard work paid off and I was able to match at a program uh, where I felt, you know, like I belonged, like it was a, uh, a uh, place that where I fit in uh, or get along with everyone. And again, that's kind of what, what you should be looking for. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, it's a matter of developing a passion. So uh, I had interest in spine and trauma, economics and policy as I, as I outlined there. And then I was able to get that research year with Praveen Muminetti at, at UCSF. I was able to do six months actually back at San Francisco. I got my master's in healthcare administration during that time, was introduced to Jeff Manley by Praveen. Um, uh, I ended up doing a rotation in the United States Senate and was able to parlay all that into this neurotrauma fellowship, uh, which led to me getting a job here. So you know, it was kind of, it was a lot of good luck. It was just fortunate that, again, when I was heading towards research here, I was cold emailing a bunch of people saying, you know, do you have any uh, spots for a research resident? And Praveen emailed back right away and said, absolutely, come on down. Um, and it was just through that that I was able to meet Manly and it was through that that I was able to, to get this fellowship. Um, so it was a lot of, a lot of fortuitous luck, um, uh, in, in following that passion. So if there's any advice and pearls I could give is, you know, when you're, if you're trying to go into neurosurgery, don't let anyone work harder than you. Um, like I said, there was a lot of luck that went into my path, but I think it was the fact that I was working harder than anyone else I could see that, that let me capitalize on that. Um, you know, that rotation at LSU, I was fortuitous to find it, but if I wasn't, uh, working my butt off, uh, I, I probably wouldn't match there. So it was a matter of me being fortuitous and showing them that I was a hard worker. <clears throat> because in neurosurgery, it really is all about your away rotations. Uh, it's a seven year match, a seven year program. Uh, so you're marrying a program for seven years and they're marrying you. Um, and it's not, it's not a one way street, right? You, you have a lot to offer that program as much as they have to offer you a, the training. So, um, you really have to show the programs that you are interested, that you're hardworking, that you're going to be a good fit there, that it really is a good match for you. Um, <clears throat> so find your match. Uh, and remember that the spots are limited. Not everyone, of course, is going to find the perfect match like I think I did uh, when I got my residency spot. Um, and 
that will require a bunch of introspection. If you, if you really, if I was at the point after my third rotation where I didn't like uh, the field and I didn't really like the training that I was looking at, uh, it was a lot of introspection and thinking, you know, should I find a different field? Should I find something else? Because the spots are limited. And if you, if you do get a spot, if you're fortunate to get a spot, uh, like I did, you're, you are also taking a spot away from someone else because there's a lot of people that go unmatched every year that would probably be very good neurosurgery residents. So I've tried to treat every day uh, like I was given this privilege um, that maybe I didn't deserve. So feeling like I had something to prove, uh, which, you know, I think is the DO students here can understand is you kind of always have that feeling like a little chip on your shoulder. So um, uh, thankfully, I was able to find a spot and, and capitalize on it. And, and the imposter syndrome still runs strong, uh, but it it's, uh, gets better. Um, and then when you're developing your passion, really find some good mentors and capitalize on those. And that's something I've been very fortunate to have around me <clears throat> um, at LSU and UCSF. Uh, just fantastic mentors like Praveen and Manley and then Jason Wilson, John Stick, Frank Kalikia, Gabe Tender at LSU. Uh, just amazing mentors um, and really can't do much without that. So um, like I said, there, there's a lot of luck involved, uh, a lot of good cir fortu fortuitous circumstances helped me get here, but um, hopefully I was, it was my hard work that allowed me to capitalize on a lot of that. So, uh, that's all I have to say. Um, and if you guys want to reach out to me by all means, I'm, I'm you know, happy to, to give any input or, uh, help you guys out wherever I can. So thank you. That was great. You get a standing ovation if, if we were in person. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I'll stand right now, but I don't know if anyone is really all up for that so if anyone has questions i i certainly have questions but I, i'll let other people uh jump in if they have anything that they'd like to ask uh, dr de giorgio um whether about uh neuro his his pathway um what he does now in, in spinal care traumatic brain injury uh his uh his research or the topic of today I don't know if you, Michael, you want to have people put their hands up and call on them. I think that, that would work too, or, or go ahead if you want to. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, however people want to do it. Um, I'm usually a fan. Of, if, if no one is just, they can just jump in if they want. No, I don't think I have a couple questions, but I'd like you guys to go, go first. for it, Eddie. All right, Maybe so, your questions will spurn another question. Go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so first of all, great talk, Dr. DiGiorgio. It was very uh, insightful. Um, it was very encouraging. And um, I'm sure we all learned a lot. So we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, I actually have a question about um, how your master's in health administration has impacted your practice. I'm currently um, getting a master's in health administration right now. Um, and so I'm very interested in the financial um, and the economic side of, uh, and the healthcare system side of medicine. So I'm just curious as to how. Yeah, you, you got cut off a little bit there at the end there, Edwin, but um, so it's helped a lot um, from uh, when you start oh, getting into your practice so far. Yeah, when you start getting into residency, you're gonna notice that so much of your day-to-day -day life is ruled by policy decisions that you have no control over. And I tried just complaining about it for the first short four years and realized that wasn't doing anything. Uh, and then I started trying to understand why these things were the way they were. Uh, and in doing so, started reading the literature, uh, enrolled myself in the, the master's program, which I think is fantastic, you are as well. And then started actually showing up to meetings. Um, and that's the biggest thing is, is showing up to these meetings and uh, using what I learned in the administration degree to be able to speak the administrator language uh, when I was showed up at these meetings and that was the biggest thing is just learning uh, how to talk in that language uh, So then when I showed up to these meetings, I could actually have an impact or feel like I had an impact. They would at least uh, uh, Acknowledge what I was saying um, And that's something that we don't do enough Especially as neurosurgeons is show up to these meetings because they're often at inopportune moments uh, and a lot of neurosurgeons think that you know, we don't have time for that and it's not important and it really is. And I don't like going to meetings, but uh, I think it's really important. And I like the results of going to meetings, um, especially if I can make even a small difference in a policy decision, uh, it's worth it. 
unfortunately it's sometimes a painful process, but that master's in healthcare administration really helped me just kind of learn to speak the same language as the administrators and be on their level. Awesome, thanks. And I do have one other question um, kind of related to, to the uh, topic at hand today from the articles. Um, I haven't done an in-depth literature search um, specifically in this area, so um, I imagine that you're familiar with all the literature in this area. Do, do any of the studies um, actually talk about the reason for the the, the reason for the surgery um, besides this trauma. Uh, for example, if someone has like gross instability for multiple myeloma or something like that, as opposed to someone that uh, has an osteoporotic fracture or again, a, a motor vehicle accident, is there anything looking at the cost um, effectiveness based, based on the actual cause of the, of the injury? Yeah, the different pathologies. Uh, there is a lot of literature out there uh, regarding that. It's usually uh, segregated into those specific fields. So the, the tumor literature is usually pretty separate than the trauma literature, which is pretty separate than the DGEN literature. Um, so that's why the quality is kind of a useful, uh, a useful thing to use because it allows comparison across uh, different, uh, different treatments and different disease pathologies. Um, so you could, you know, you could look at the qualities of treatments, surgical treatments for tumors and compare them to surgical treatments for trauma. Um, as flawed as I think that they are as an overall statistic to, to focus on, uh, they do allow that kind of cross comparison. Um, and there certainly is like if you look up, uh, you know, uh, surgical intervention for uh, spinal column tumors, there, there is economic uh, literature on that for sure. Awesome. Thanks. If no one else has a question, I'm going to ask my hundred. I do. All right. Really quick Go ahead. Um, thank you, Dr. DiGiorgio, for such a great talk. Um, I was just curious that you had mentioned. John, introduce yourself real quick. Oh, um, my name is Keanu. I'm a second year student at the University of Colorado. Um, so you had spoke about when you had done your away rotations, you had done three and they weren't a great fit for you at least. And you got to LSU and you're like, wow, I love this program. Like what made your love for that program stand out versus, you know, the hundreds of other sub eyes that rotated and like, you know, what, what made your love for LSU's program? Like what resulted in them pick choosing you, you think? I got lucky. Um, you know, there, there was no other student, there was no LSU student that year that had really wowed them. Um, and the other couple people that rotated through and interviewed, um, for whatever reason, they just, uh, they didn't fit there as well. Um, you know, like I said, it, it, it really is a match. It's a match of personalities. Um, it's a match of location. It's a match of hard work. Um, you know, so it, it's just, I, I fit in with the people there. I really got along with the faculty. Um, you know, I answered most of the pimp questions, right. Which helped. I, I, I took call at night. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they, the upper level residents hazed me a bit. Uh, and it just, you know, like I said, it was just luck, but they, they were a, a one spot a year program. So if there was, you know, one other person they liked just a little bit more, I probably wouldn't have gotten that spot. Um, and I know Dr. Stottinger, you put in, that is one of my favorite quotes from Pastor, uh, the chance here is a prepared mind, but you know, I, I did work my butt off there. I took call basically Q2 for the entire month for all four rotations. So you could, you know, you can imagine how gassed you are at the end, but that's how, that's how your audition rotation should be is you know, that those will probably be the, the four hardest working months in your life um, because you even, you work harder than the residents uh, when you're on your away rotations you know, with the amount of call you take. So, uh, it, but again, it, it was a lot of hard work combined with, with just some good luck. Thank you. Also be modest. A number of times Dr. Georgia said the word luck, but he's clearly worked his ass off of this. He's, is I think telling in itself. Um, so, uh, so I have a couple of questions. The first is um, particular uh, about the topic. So, uh, Dr. Georgia, what what are your current research interests um, as it relates to spinal cord injury, um, and uh, what is your understanding of the biomechanics of different injury? Um, uh, pathologies in terms of, you know, flexion extension, uh, different um, precipitating uh, injuries, whether it's blunt force, you know, like in an MVC versus a fall, 
Um, certainly in this paper, we saw that the, the fall incidence is increasing and has the patient population in general increases. Um, how do you see that affecting your, your practice moving forward? So uh, I guess my question is just, you know, what are you looking forward to from a research perspective and how do you think um, those factors are gonna influence your clinical practice? Yeah, uh, so that, that's a probably six hour uh, answer I could give you, but we'll try to condense it. Uh, so research wise at, uh, at San Francisco General and UCSF, we have uh, track SCI. I'm sure you guys have probably seen some of the literature on track TBI, uh, which is Jeff Manley's um, prospective uh, traumatic brain injury database, multi-center, uh, where he has basically 3,500 patients with two-year follow-ups with traumatic brain injury uh, with biomarkers, MRIs, and whatnot. We're doing the same thing with spinal cord injury. We have about 180 patients, I think, enrolled so far, uh, and uh, we are tracking their outcomes over time. Uh, trauma patients are extremely difficult to have longitudinal outcomes on because of the nature of the patient population. Follow-up is uh, challenging. Uh, so our database we're pretty proud of, and we are starting to mine that um, to see uh, you know, what we can glean from, again, these prospective cohort studies. Um, you know, I would love to do randomized trials if it were ethical, but it's not uh, in, in spinal cord injury. So we are, we're using these you know, prospective cohort studies. Uh, so my research interests are in a lot of that. And I would love to expand that um, to your second question, which is biomechanics. Uh, we don't have a lot of good answers on the biomechanics of a lot of these bony injuries. Um, you mentioned the TLIC score, which is a great scoring system. Uh, basically, when someone has a neurologic deficit, you're almost always put into the surgical category. Uh, the question arises is, what do you do when they don't have a neurologic deficit, and how do you assess those fractures for uh, whether or not they need surgery? And uh, the TLIC score helps. The AO stuff can help. Um, you have the, uh, <clears throat> the Denis three-column injury system, which can help uh, make a surgical decision. But uh, we don't have any long-term data on this uh, because, again, uh, the trauma populations are very difficult, and that requires a lot of resources to track those sorts of people. So uh, from a research interest standpoint, I would like to expand track SCI and uh, you know, look longitudinally at a lot of these fractures, like the flexion distractions. Do we need to be operating on all of them? Uh, we really don't know. Uh, and how do they do it? Do you mind if I interject <clears throat> just quickly? Yeah, quick? please. Um, <clears throat> what's the role of cadaveric studies in some of this in terms of, uh, is there a role, and do they use cat cadaveric um, models uh, at UCSF yeah. to we don't we don't that much uh, the cadaveric studies have been done it's hard to replicate the uh, exact fracture patterns um, because of the forces uh, applied um, and then it's it's more of a long-term instability uh, versus a short-term thing so it's you know someone with a burst fracture that gets up and is walking around on it for six months uh, and then develops a kyphotic deformity you know that you can't really simulate that in a cadaver um, you, you really need a, a living person walking around with that injury for the rest of their life because um, that, that's your your you know treatment decision there is are you going to be able to to exist with this one for the rest of their life or, or do you need surgery and then uh you mentioned the, the aging population and the different etiologies we see it it's uh just a little anecdote that the um, difference in patient population that i've seen in san francisco compared to when i was at lsu uh, you know, in New Orleans Charity Hospital, we were the uh, one of the few level one trauma centers in the entire state. So we would get uh, injuries from all over the state, uh, you know, the big major highways, uh, five hours away uh, with a big MVC that would come into our hospital. San Francisco General, uh, we only take within the city limits of San Francisco because there's other trauma centers in the Bay Area dotted around there. We have a good uh, volume, but it's mostly uh, the older people you know, falling off the curb or falling downstairs. So it's a totally different uh, injury pattern and patient population that we see there uh, compared to what I saw at LSU. Um, <clears throat> so the, the elderly data is a lot more relevant to our practice at San Francisco General. Um, and, and we do take that into account. And we've had some, you know, 80 something, 90 something year olds come in with severe spinal cord injuries and have to have a you know real conversation with the families about, you know, what are we going to do? Or is it, is it worth considering not operating on your loved one, uh, just because the risks are so high, things like that. It's interesting. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, a kind of a, a related question. Um, so something that's fascinating to me is like the the two 
injury mechanism to the spinal cord. So the initial blunt penetrating injury, and then this phenomenon of like several hours afterwards where then spinal cord then is at risk from um, several different mechanisms that I found in the literature, whether it's reactive oxygen species or uh, edema, hemorrhage, um, what have you. Um, and um, in terms of someone that comes in with an, a, a complete spinal cord injury, um, let's say in the thoracolumbar area, um, what are the, you know, what are the implications from uh, an acute treatment standpoint for some of that stuff and whether or not that, if you know of any research that um, that mechanism affects the spinal cord um, long-term um, above the injury. Um, I don't know if you're, if you're, I, I know that there's some like research in terms of syrinx development and some things like that um, after the injury that can affect the, the spinal cord above the injury. But um, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, maybe some things that I could start looking at to guide my my interest there. Yeah, so uh, you have your acute uh, injury, you have your secondary injury, which you, you mentioned, the swelling, the reactive oxygen species, and then you have the long-term sequelae from that. Uh, the neurosurgical literature is usually focused on the first two. Uh, the long-term sequelae, you're going to find more in the uh, PM&R and rehabilitation literature um, mm -hmm. because they're, they're the people that deal with it. Again, mm -hmm. because the neurosurgeons, uh, follow-up is so difficult long-term for these patients. We're trying to fix that with things like track SCI, um, but really we're not the ones that are managing these patients, you know, two, five, 10 years after their injury. So that, that, those studies tend to fall into the PM&R literature. Uh, but from our standpoint, we're very active in the acute management, not only surgical, but in the ICU. Um, so surgically, obviously decompression is the, the main, you know, the mainstay of treatment. Um, some people will do a routine duroplasty where they'll actually open up the dura and sew a patch in to allow it to expand, <clears throat> excuse me, so allow the, the cord to swell and expand uh, and to allow more room. That's relatively rare. Not that many people do that. We don't do it routinely at San Francisco General, but some people do advocate for it. Uh, what we will do is ultrasound the spinal cord, uh, and if it swells, we will then sew in a patch. So it's kind of a selective duroplasty. Uh, and then postoperatively, there's a ton of literature on acute care management of spinal cord injury. Um, you want spinal cord perfusion pressures. So we put lumbar drains in our patients and we perfuse uh, them to a spinal cord perfusion pressure over five days. Um, there are a whole lot of protocols for spinal cord injury patients in the acute setting to prevent DVTs, to prevent bed sores, uh, for feeding, um, <clears throat> for mobilization, um, for respiratory issues. Uh, you know, Even a low cervical spine injury uh, can have severe respiratory issues, right? So even though your diaphragm is innervated by C345, uh, if you have a C7 injury, uh, you would still lose your intercostals and your abdominal muscles. So you are still at risk, high risk for um, development of pneumonia and atelectasis. You will lose 50% uh, of your vital capacity with a C7 injury. So even though your diaphragm is still fully innervated, uh, you lose 50% of vital capacity that way. Uh, so in someone who's elderly with a, you know, already has diminished lung capacity, that could be uh, critical. So there's a whole bunch of literature out there on the acute management. And again, this is a lot of stuff that's still uh, being worked out on track SCI. <clears throat> we are also involved in uh, one of the uh, studies called CAMPER, uh, where they're looking at uh, um, CSF drainage to maintain spinal cord perfusion pressure and actually sending off CSF for um, biomarker studies to see uh, if there's any molecular biomarkers we can use to track it. Um, there are different studies looking at evoked potentials, both intraoperatively and postoperatively, um, to see if you can track motor evoked potentials and sensory evoked potentials and correlate those with uh, spinal cord perfusion. Uh, so there's all sorts of literature out there. Um, so again, if, if you're looking at the acute uh, care, that's gonna come more neurocritical care, neurosurgery. Um, uh, journal of Neurotrauma is a great journal for that along with, you know, JNS and, and neurosurgery. And then the, the long-term stuff will be more in the rehabilitation literature. That's great. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? I'll, I'll say we got five, 10 minutes, maybe. Yeah. Hi, I've, I've got a question. Uh, this is Dr. Kramer from KCU. Um, uh, this is a question coming from a basic science background who I, I've got uh, no, no education really at all in the economics of um, policy in this regard. But I, I just had a question. Uh, when you're looking at the 
uh, either the uh, kind of the meta-analysis data or uh, po uh, policy decision at a local hospital, how much weight is given to the difference in, say, the cost of living somewhere like San Francisco uh, versus the, um, you know, south, southwest Missouri area in terms of, of you know, separating out the data for the, the um, efficiency indexes and things that you were talking about. And then, uh, like I said, ultimately in the, in the given hospital's policy. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, the cost of a, of a rehab bed or an RN, um, the overhead costs in San Francisco are extraordinarily different than in the Midwest or uh, in Canada, as those other papers were. Um, so, you know, in, in quality, uh, in quality calculations, it's, you know, usually they use whatever model was local for them. So I think for the, the stasis uh, study, they used their local costing guidelines. But um, getting into the economics behind things like overhead costs, there are a ton of different methods. If, um, if you look up uh, um, costing methods, uh, uh, Porter from uh, Harvard has some good articles on that where they try to break down the actual um, uh, value-based costing of each individual involved in the care of a person. So, you know, a, a nurse works on this patient for three hours in a day, that's worth, you know, three hours out of her, you know, whatever hourly rate is, or you know, a neurosurgeon works on it for seven hours in a day, and that's one seventh of his daily, uh, you know, cost for that. So there's the, the cost literature is another rabbit hole you can go down to where, again, when I mentioned that there are assumptions abound in the cost data, uh, that's why, because just switching up how you do your costing uh, analysis will can yield drastically different results. Um, uh, you know, if patients are fee for service versus capitated, uh, makes a huge difference. Um, you know, Kaiser is fairly fully capitated system, so they do their cost accounting in a completely different way than someone who is fully fee for service would do their cost accounting. Um, and, and that is all taken into account, and you really have to get into the nitty gritty and look at their methods when you're analyzing, analyzing these uh, to see exactly how they did their cost methods because what applies in Canada or what applies in Kansas uh, is probably not the same as what applies in San Francisco. I had a quick comment. Um, first of all, student Dr. Cords and McCray, thank you so much for bringing uh, this platform. I'm going to come at you guys at a little different angle, and that's of one of a, a patient. Uh, my neuroscientist holds a special place in my heart, my neurosurgeon. His name is Paul Arnold at KU Med. Age 13, I had a pretty bad herniated disc injury doing stupid lifting. Age 46, it finally ruptured and herniated in three places. So I, had L I know this is not cervical, it was L4, L5, but the nerve coming off my spine was impinged. So I had foot drop and I couldn't control certain bodily functions at age 46. So between 13 and 46, lived with pain at the various levels at various days, anywhere from five to 11. It was an awful life. And then that acute injury sent me right up the food chain in terms of you're a high priority patient at age 46. And my neurosurgeon changed the trajectory of my life. I love that man. <laughs> so you guys who are endeavoring to become neurosurgeons, you will change lives. Uh, and hopefully, the first surgery for me went really, really good. I, I live with zero pain as long as I don't do too many stupid things. Uh, the other thing I'll say, and so you, you're to be congratulated on your endeavors. Uh, and thus, I am living proof that if you get up every day and work towards something, you will achieve it, whether it's becoming a, a neurosurgeon or basic biomedical researcher, which is kind of my jam. But I just want to appreciate everybody in this room and in particular make you aware of the importance of neurosurgeons in my life. And I know there's people all across this country that feel the same way. So thank you so much. 
I think that that's a great point. And I'm glad you're you're doing well. Dr. Arnold is a fantastic surgeon, so uh, give him some credit. Um, but that you know, when I mentioned that neurosurgery is a privilege, you know, every day you're going to be tired and grumpy, and you're going to want to uh, you know skip out on a case or you know take an opportunity to to, to go home and just get two hours of sleep. Um, but you know, if you if you miss that case, you might have learned you know the technique that that made all the difference. Uh, you know, in, in that patient's life. And, you know, you will have never learned that technique if you miss out on it. Seven years seems like a long time to do training, but I can tell you the last year of my training, I was walking around going, oh God, this is the last time I'm going to do X case under supervision. And next time I'm going to be on my own. <laughs> um, it's really humbling to, to all of a sudden uh, realize that you're not going to be taught every little trick and intricacy um, by someone else anymore. And, and you owe it to your patients to, um, to learn as much as you can. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sanger. I, I think it's always good to get a, a, a patient perspective on everything that's going on. Um, certainly right now, of all the crazy stuff that's happening, <laughs> it's uh, it kind of gives perspective on why you do what you do every day, 24 hours a day, it feels like. Um, well, if I, you know, I could, we could talk for hours. Um, I, I, I'll, unless someone has a pressing question, I think we can end here. I think that's a good way to end. Um, and if you guys have particular questions, uh, we'll, we'll do our, do our due diligence in terms of getting this posted, uh, in the appropriate, uh, areas, um, as well as, uh, Dr. Giorgio, we'll try to, uh, I'll send you an email and we'll get all the links that you had, um, put in your presentation as well as anything else you think is valuable that we can put, um, on the canvas page, as well as for all the, uh, energy members that are here, um, to, uh, you know foster their research interest as well as their their training uh, pathway um so yeah if you guys have if you guys have any burning questions um to doc, dr DeGiorgio, he's pretty active on twitter as well as on uh, that's how actually I, I reached out to him was on on twitter um initially so um in this COVID era um you know building connections is really important and so um without being annoying uh maybe dr DeGiorgio thinks i'm annoying but uh we got them here, so that that's I'm calling it a win. Um, you, you try to build connections with the programs, like you said, you know, cold calling programs to figure out, you know, where figure out places where you can be. And uh, I know Eddie and I both did that for our research uh, years, so that's that's really important. And and don't, you know, the worst thing they can say is no. Um, and if you're respectful and and polite, you'll you're usually not going to make an enemy, even if they do say no. So. Um, with that, Dr. Giorgio, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everyone for being here, Shelly and Dr. Soninger. And um, if uh, hopefully we can get you on sometime in the future again, Dr. Giorgio. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. That'd be great. All right, guys. You guys have a great day. All right, take care.